to Restoration Ministries Church. We hold services at the beautiful Douglas Lake Resort Clubhouse here in Sevierville, Tennessee, and we would love to have you join us. Our services are held every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And you can find all the information for directions on our Facebook page, which is Restoration Ministries. We would love to have you come and see that it's good to be home. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. So I want to welcome you to Restoration Ministries Church. Uh, we're excited about the things that are happening uh, in uh, and amongst us. And so today, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to remind you of what we talked about last week. We talked about soaring with eagles. And if you recall, the way in which we got that message was Tracy and I had the beautiful opportunity to be out on the lake. And we found this island. We pitched a little mini campsite with some chairs. I had my actual uh, table and my computer and my Bible uh, there as I was seeking God. And, and we were praying and, and actually coming off a time of fasting. And as we were there, Tracy uh, showed her parents on uh, FaceTime the location that we were at and so that they could enjoy the nature. And right as she began to talk to them, an eagle, a bald eagle came flying out of the tree above our heads and across the lake. It, it was a beautiful thing. And actually, I was seeking God to say, what should I be uh, teaching my message on? So uh, I had Tracy ask her father, what should I talk about? And he said, well, I think there it is. That, that's it. You just saw. You should speak about the eagle. So last week, we talked about soaring with the eagle. So this week, as I was preparing uh, and getting my message ready, I thought, you know, that worked out pretty good. Why don't we call? And so Tracy called her parents. And her mother answered the phone, and I said, okay, so last week you did a great job. You guys gave me my message. It was given by my father-in-law. I said, so this week, what do you think? And so my mother-in-law says, well, just like off the top of her head, what about hummingbirds? And I thought, well, I don't know. What about hummingbirds? So I looked and I searched, and you know, there's not one reference when you look in Strong's Concordance of a mention of a hummingbird in the Bible. However, as I prayed about it and I sought out God, I feel like he gave me, gave me a message that ties in last week soaring with the eagle and this week linking in the little hummingbird. And so today we're going to talk about the wonder of flight. You know, as we are out and, and outside in nature, Tracy and I look and, and just so much enjoy and get great peace and comfort. It's where God speaks to us when we're out in nature. And so as we're out there and we're at the local lake that uh, we get to enjoy, we see all kinds, literally hundreds of species of birds and many of the waterfowl that are on the water. And as we see them, especially those that are uh, those that swim in the water, we see them. And if I have my grandkids with me, especially they would like to go towards those birds because they can see them take flight. And some of them take flight so gracefully. If you have this beautiful egret, uh, we have these beautiful snow white birds, these egrets that are there, and they're tall and they're standing in the water. When they take flight, they begin to flap these majestic, huge wings and very gracefully take flight. And then there's this other bird called the cormorant. It's kind of a duckish looking uh, bird. However, it roosts and nests in trees, which when it goes and lands in the trees, it looks like they're going to surely die. They hit the branches and the whole tree flops off. Usually there's a big fuss with the other birds that are around because it isn't graceful at all. And when they take off out of the water, it's just like they're flapping their wings. They're running with their webbed feet on the water. And it's like, you're not going to go. And you're wondering as you're coming up upon them on the boat, are they going to get out of the way in time? Every time they do, but very different methods of flying. And so today, as we explore the wonder of flight, we're going to tie this in uh, scripturally. And so it's going to be a little bit of a stretch. You're going to have to be with me here. But we're going to talk about the mighty, majestic eagle and how he flies. And the simple, smallest bird, the hummingbird, and how they fly. The eagle soars as God has designed them to. They put their wings and extend them out and allow them to catch the thermals. And as we talked about last week, when a storm arises for an eagle, they're able to take those thermals and actually rise up above the storm to be safe. 
If a hummingbird tried to do the same thing, he would die. Just like if an eagle tried to do what the hummingbird does, flapping his wings, he would die. The hummingbird instead, he can also survive a storm. He can actually fly in any direction. He can go upside down, right side up, frontwards, backwards, sideways. The hummingbird has this, un this unbelievable ability to fly in any direction and have these super sensory uh, perceptive, uh, this perceptiveness that allows them to react to their environment. And when they're in a storm and the rains come upon them, they can actually adjust the angles of their wings and their body so that the water, which if they just stood still, the water would take on 38% of their body weight would be increased and they would not be able to withstand it and they would crash to the ground. But because they can adjust, they can fly. If the eagle tried to fly like a hummingbird, he would perish because the lactic acid would build up so great in his body, he would not be able to remain in the air. If a hummingbird tried to soar catching a thermal, he would surely die because he would perish and come plummeting to the ground. Because that's not the way they were designed. That's not what they were called to do. They were both called to flight, but not in the same way. So today I want to look at us and how God created us, how he created us in a spiritual sense to fly, to thrive, to exist in the perfect way which he designed. But if we try to do it some other way that he has not designed us, that we are called to do, that we will perish. But if we, thrive, we can thrive, if we do what he has called us to do. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your creation. I thank you, Lord God, for the detail that you put in to the birds, the 7,200 feathers you placed upon the eagle, Lord God, and the mighty little muscles that you've given the little hummingbird, Lord God, that allows them both to thrive in the way that you created them to be. And Father, I am much more thankful that you created us. You created me, Lord God, that you saw that it was good. In fact, your word says, when you created man, that you said it was very good. So Lord God, I'm asking today that you would reveal to all of us that we are created very good, Lord God, and that your plans and your purposes for our lives are for us to thrive and for us in a spiritual sense to fly. Allow us to fly, Lord God. Allow us to fly today as you call us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So I want to turn uh, with me, if you will, to Psalm 39. We're going to begin in verse 13. This is a pretty familiar uh, piece of uh, scripture. I'm going to read, beginning in verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Who formed you? Let's start there. Who formed you? God himself. The creator of all that you see. This beautiful environment that we live in in East Tennessee. The lakes, the mountains, the nature we get to enjoy. God created that. But he also created you. Not just created you on the outside, but your inward parts. In your mother's womb. The psalmist goes on to write, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame is not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw me. Unformed substance in your book were written. Every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. We all came to existence. We all came to being, to walk in this earth at this time with a very specific purpose. It doesn't matter how you may have entered into the world. It doesn't matter if someone has told you that you weren't meant to be here, that you were an accident, that you are not uh, something that God specifically designed, that you have no purpose, that you have no calling. If you've been told you'll never amount to anything, I would just say to you to stand up, rise up, and say that 
is a lie. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, enemy. That is not, that is not what God created you to be. He had purpose for you. He had calling for you. And there's three points I want to bring out of this scripture, and I want to walk through this, comparing some things with the eagle and with the hummingbird and tying it all in at the end. Number one, God created you. God created you. Number two, you are marvelous, marvelously set apart. And his works, his works within you, in what you are, his work in you is wonderful. And number three, God's plans for you are countless. We all need to acknowledge and understand he has a plan for us. We aren't just to just get by. We're not just to exist in some mundane environment, but we are to thrive. We are to exist in a way that we accomplish what God has planned for us. And guess what? He's given you, he's given me Plans that are beyond our capability, are beyond what we can do with our own might and our own strength and our own intellect. He's given us a plan that requires us to have fellowship with him because why were we created? What is the first purpose of our creation? It's to be in relationship with God the Father, to be in relationship with Jesus the Son, to be in relationship with the Holy Spirit, to be in relationship with with the Trinity, the Godhead. That is why he created us. And so he has no intention for you to walk through this life on your own without any regard for him and what he wants to do with you. And guess what? His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, than our ways. He will take us to places that will be naturally impossible for us to go. He is the God of miracles. He is the God of the supernatural. So let's go through each one of those, beginning with God created. So tying it into our birds, God created the majestic eagle, and he created the very delicate and intricate hummingbird. He created them both. Can you think in your life, of somebody that's so radically different. Sometimes I wonder, as I look at people who are in the same family, how they can be so radically different. But God created us all in a unique way with a unique purpose. And God created the eagle. He created the hummingbird. And as we talked about, their methods of flight were specifically designed for them uniquely and individually. So let's compare and contrast them. So I've got some information, so I'm going to be in my notes here for a few seconds. So first of all, the wingspan. So the wingspan of the eagle, this is on average, is about five and a half feet is their wingspan. So their wingspan is beyond the height of my wife. So if Tracy, if you saw her this morning giving a greeting to you, so her height that is how wide the eagle's majestic wings spread. That is opposed to the hummingbird, which fully extended will be about three, maybe four inches. The hummingbird's wingspan is so small. The eagle's wingspan is greater than 18 times, almost 20 times as great. But yet both were designed and purposed to fly. The little tiny wings and the great majestic wings. And eagles weight, some are much bigger, there's variation, but if you look, about the average eagle is 15 to 20 pounds. For a bird, that's a big bird. It's bigger than our little dog. In fact, we, when we lived in Ohio, we had a bird try to Take our little dog, we have a little Pomeranian Chihuahua, it says also fox on this paperwork, was taken and grabbed by a bird. We couldn't figure out what his wounds were from, but it, it was the talons, I believe, of a hawk that were upon him. The hummingbird 
weighs 3.2 grams. So you know, like if you get like a little tiny package, like those airport packages, I mean, that it weighs less than that of those kind of materials. So the eagle weighs nearly 2,000 times what a hummingbird weighs, but yet the eagle somehow can fly. You could say the hummingbird, if it's so light, it can just be taken by the wind, but both radically different can fly. The food, the eagle primarily's diet is on fish, small uh, mammals, the hummingbird's primary diet is on insects, and where it gets its rapid, crazy metabolism and energy is from the nectar, the sweetness of the flower. Their sleep patterns, I found this to be really interesting. Typically, some people say an eagle is nocturnal, most are not, the bald eagle in particular is not. And most bald eagles will go into their majestic nest, some of which will weigh over a ton what they created. A few years back, we were able to see a nest on the water, it was just rarely good. I mean, the, it, it was using sticks like this diameter for their nest. But they'll sleep from sundown to sunrise with a bald eagle. Interestingly enough, the hummingbird actually goes into a thing called topar, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, T-O-P-O-R, it's a form of hibernation. That the hummingbird, because its metabolism is so great, because it's so actively processing everything that allows it to flap its wings the way it flaps its wings and the way it flies, it, it, it consumes so much energy. A hummingbird has to eat more than three times its weight every day to be able to survive. But if the hummingbird didn't go into this topar, this form of hibernation, they actually would die in their sleep because their body's metabolism would consume itself because it's so fast and so rapid. So if they shut down, their bodies actually, when they go to sleep, they'll shut down to a place that is, is almost uh, where their beat, uh, heartbeat is just barely evident. Isn't that amazing? An amazing God created both to do such radical different things, but both of them so that they can fulfill what he's called them to do, what he's asked them to be. Their vision. We talked last week, an eagle can see three to four miles. Wow. As we saw the eagle last week uh, hovering over the lake, he dove down into the water with his talons first, uh, to get a fish, but he was way in the air when he made his descent. But he saw something underneath the water, and God's equipped him with that kind of vision. The hummingbird is like no other animal. The, God has created his part of his brain that controls his vision function to be significantly larger and by size larger than any other animal's in the animal kingdom, bird, mammal, any kind of reptile. And that, that, that part of its brain that controls its vision allows it to have uh, the ability to distinguish between his rapid wing movement that he's hovering and an insect coming beside him. That's why even if you're close, if you've ever been close to a hummingbird, if you twitch just a little bit, they'll respond. Their vision is so detailed that they can pick up any slight little motion, even in the wind, that they can make an adjustment in their flight. And finally, their flight. The eagle soars, dependent on the thermals of the wind. As we mentioned last week, he's not worried about the storms that come his way. He knows there'll be a thermal of wind that isn't inside of his control, but is actually the source and the power that will lift him up above the storm. The hummingbird. The hummingbird can fly more than 60 miles per hour. When they're courting the other uh, birds, they'll actually fly up into the air and they'll just do a free fall, straight down. People say that the average height that a male hummingbird will fly to is about 60 feet, and he'll come within a fraction of an inch 
to the female to impress her and just stop <laughs> suddenly. God's equipped him to be able to do that. The hummingbird, when he flies, instead of soaring with no effort like the eagle, the hummingbird instead, on average, is flapping its wings 80 times per second. When they're in the state, when they're coming down, the males, and they're plummeting down to impress the female and to stop, they say that their, their wing flapping is near 200 flaps per second. Wow. The point here, we're talking about God's creative ability, his power, his intricate, intimate design that has purpose for these birds. So how much more if God who created the birds but also created us and created us in his image, how much more detail has gone into our lives? How much more investment has he made into our plan? The plan he has for us, not the plan that we have for us. He created us with purpose and with a plan. So first of all, as we look at the eagle, as we look at the hummingbird, very uniquely different. They have to embrace how God created them. Can you imagine an eagle trying to flap his wings 80 times per minute? Can you imagine an eagle courting a female eagle and soaring, relatively speaking, it would be from miles in the air and trying to stop inches away from her? He's going to fail. But imagine the hummingbird being out in the storm and saying, oh, I don't need to flap my wings anymore. I'm just going to soar and let the thermal catch me. No, he's going to fall and he's going to plummet to his death. They each have to embrace what God created them to be. We have to create, embrace what God has created us to be. Secondly, the birds are marvelously set apart. They're set apart just like we are set apart. The hummingbird, you know, is, is uh, with the bees and the hummingbirds combined, they're the most responsible for why we have flowers, why our gardens grow. The whole act of pollination is very much dependent upon the hummingbird. The hummingbird is marvelous. They're set apart. They're set apart to accomplish that purpose. God's creative work in both of them is wonderful. So as Psalm says that they're wonderfully and marvelously made and set apart, they're set apart just like you are set apart. And number three, God's plan for them both is for flight, but accomplishes it, accomplishes their calling, if you will, in very different ways. So let's look and apply these observations. We've made some of the observations already, but let's look at that applied to our lives. God created you. I know I've said that many times, but we need to all get that deeply rooted. It needs to be in our heart. It needs to go from knowledge in our head down about a foot and rest in our heart and our soul. We have to know that we know. We have to believe that God created us for such a time as this. There's no one else that can be in this time with more purpose than you, regardless of occupation, regardless of your lot in life, regardless of your position. You were created specifically to be here at this time for a specific purpose. I want to turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1 and verses, uh, we're going to read 3 through 14. 2 Peter 3 through 14. The title of my Bible is Confirm Your Calling and Election. Again, we're talking about God's creative work inside of us. First of all, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. 
having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and, bro and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. Having forgotten that he was cleansed from the former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you, this is Paul talking, always to remind you of these qualities. Though you do not have them, you are established in the truth so that you do have them. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of this reminder, since I know that putting off of my body will be soon, as the Lord Jesus Christ made it clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Actually, this was written by Peter, obviously, Second Peter, not Paul. You were called for a divine purpose, for a specific purpose. The enemy would have attacks placed upon your life to try to prevent you from accomplishing purpose. So here, Peter is writing, and he's saying, here's how you defeat the enemy's attack. Here's how you partake in the divine nature. It's what we said earlier. God doesn't intend for you just to walk in the natural, but he intends you to thrive in the supernatural. And how does he look you, want you to do it? He wants you to do it, first of all, by faith. In other parts of scripture, it says that a double-minded man will literally be spewed out, that he's useless. We need to have our faith and our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. And know that we know that's in him that we can trust. We must walk in virtue. We're talking about making our calling sure. We're talking about resisting the enemy from, who is trying to prohibit us from walking in our calling. We need to be virtuous. Behavior that demonstrates righteousness, goodness, doing what is right. To have a high moral standard. To walk in knowledge. And how does the Bible tell us we'll get knowledge? It says that we will have knowledge beyond our understanding. He will give us peace beyond our understanding. He has something that is higher in the way of understanding. And how do we get it? We must seek him. Seek that knowledge. Self-control. We all have gone through this in, the, in this season of my life as I've been just totally enjoying my grandchildren. I hear their parents all the time telling them, is that self-control? In fact, my youngest daughter has a method to calm down, especially my middle grandson that she has. She says, Everly, put your hands in self-control. And immediately he claps his hand, except he that's the only thing that stays still. His whole body's shaking and moving because he wants to do something else. But they're teaching him the principle of self-control. And sometimes we need to do like my daughter is doing to myself. Sometimes in our walk in life, we need to just stop and say, quit. Just be still. The Bible tells us to be still and know that he is God. We need to exercise self-control. That's how we can recognize, that's how we can walk within our calling. The next is to be steadfast, unwavering, consistent. 
that we know, that we show others, that they can see an example within us that says, you know what, it doesn't matter. If they look at you and say, oh man, they're going through a tough season. They've had this loss, they've had this thing happen, they've had all of this calamity, but yet they see you walking through that. Yea, you don't walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that you walk through it with integrity, that you walk through it, not by yourself, but with the Lord himself leading you, guiding you, directing your path. There's no promise that you won't go through things. In fact, I would say there almost is a promise you will. The good news is my God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will always love you unconditionally. Be steadfast. Be godly. We are created in God's image. If we don't know what his image should look like, how can we reflect that in our lives? It is my prayer, it should be our prayer, that we don't project an image other than that of Jesus Christ who lives within us. That when people look at us, they see the characteristics of Jesus. They see the love of Jesus. They see the righteous indignation for things that are wrong. They see you taking up a stand, taking and standing in the gap. They see you praying for your family and for others. They see you behaving in a way that God has prescribed us to behave in his word. Being godly. That we have brotherly affection. Many of my examples are with my grandkids. One of the things that I hear, whether I'm in Oklahoma, Ohio, or in Tennessee, where all my girls and their husbands and their kids are, is I hear them say, because all of, all of their families, they all have siblings. It's awesome. Here in a week or so, we're going to get together with all of them. It'll be total chaos. It'll be a total celebration. But I hear the parents saying to them often, are you preferring others? Or are you being selfish? Are you preferring others? Are you preferring your brother? Are you preferring your sister? Are you being selfish? Sometimes those behaviors that we have are two, three, four, five, six years old. Those go on into our adult life. And instead of looking and saying, I am and I will be my brother's keeper, we instead go down a different path. We prefer ourselves. We have selfish behavior. Or we say, you know what? I really don't want to get in the middle of that. But I think the Bible would challenge us. I think Jesus would challenge us. I think the Holy Spirit leads us to a place where we look and we say, we should have compassion. We should have empathy. We shouldn't just be sympathetic and say, oh, that's bad. We should say, that's bad, but I think I can help. We should extend that hand. If we have resources, we should extend those resources. For what are the things that we've been that have been placed in our hands, but tools for us to reach others? We should be our brother's keeper. We should be showing brotherly affection. And then finally, Peter says, walk sure of your calling to participate in the divine nature that God created you to participate in. You should show love. Love never fails. And what is love? It's patient. It's kind. It doesn't boast. Love never fails. We need to incorporate that into our lives. If we want to be what everything that God created us to be, he created us in his image. And if we follow these eight things, faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love, We will be reflecting God and his image the way he created us. Don't let anyone identify you otherwise. Don't let anyone identify you as something less than God has called you to be. I know that it can hurt. I've been in a situation where a counselor when I was young 
told me there's no way you can accomplish this thing that I had purposed and that I had targeted my, my sight on. No way you can accomplish that. Well, guess what? They were wrong. That very thing that they said is something that I actually participate in every day in my daily life. But if I were to listen to that and not listen to the still small voice of the Lord, I would have walked in a path that could have even led to disobedience because God created me to do things. The Bible says he will give you the desires of your heart. Guess what? There's a condition on that. That's if your, your desires are aligning with what he's called you to do. How do you do that? You align by doing these eight things we just covered. You were created in his image. You were created with a plan and a purpose. And number two, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully made because God, it, it's, it's the same root word as it says when you are, as it says in other parts of scripture that you are to fear the Lord. This is a healthy type of fear. The Bible can't contradict itself. So it's not a spirit of fear where you're sitting terrified and tremble of some evil. The Bible says, I have not given you a spirit of fear. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is reverence. What we're talking about is awe. What we're talking about is looking at God and seeing him for what he is and his ability and what he has done and knowing that he holds literally the whole world. He holds our destiny in his hands. And as a result, we have this reverence for him. We have this fear of him. And we were fearfully made because we were made in his image. You were wonderfully made. He made you with this capability to connect in to him in relationship with him that you should see signs and wonders as a testimony of your walk and your life. You are a wonder. And as a result, you will perform wonders not through your own strength and might and power, but through the strength of the Holy One, God Almighty. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to read this uh, whole chapter. It's about spiritual gifts. And again, we're talking about you being wonderfully, fearfully made. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning, excuse me, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to, to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one says Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, just like the eagle, just like the hummingbird, have a variety of gifts and they're different. But the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and every one. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit of the common good. For to one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom. And to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another various kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. God creates you individually. God creates you with a special set of gifts, and these are spiritual gifts that he creates you with. One body and, one, and many members. For just as a body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many members. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. So today I would just ask you, are you a foot? Are you a hand? Are you an eye? What part of the body are you? It's important that we recognize that God created us uniquely. He marvelously made us. But if I'm an eye and I'm trying to be a foot, we're going to go in the wrong direction. I'm going to be led astray. 
But we need to work together. That's the way God has designed us. The story goes on and talks about the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. How many times do we categorize the place in life that we may find ourselves? This is why the Bible says we shouldn't cover our, no our neighbor's things. We shouldn't look and say, I want that so badly that I'm willing to do something inappropriate to get it. We shouldn't be jealous of the things that are flowing in that way. No, instead, we should celebrate that. Because here the Bible says that what we would perceive as the weaker part actually may be the stronger. Now, you are the body of Christ, it says in verse 27, individual members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kinds of tongues. All are, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still more excellent way. The excellent way he shows us is that we need to embrace our differences. We need to look and say, I was created, and if I'm an eye, I'm going to be the best eye I can be. I'm going to do everything I can to strengthen my vision. I'm going to do everything I can to see and prophetically look into the future. But I'm also not going to just depend on my own understanding, my own strength, and my own power. I'm going to look to God from who has given me this gift and say, God, how can I use this? How can I be accountable? The point is, he's given us all gifts. And we're to be good stewards of those gifts and acknowledge and celebrate the differences. I celebrate the difference between an eagle and a hummingbird. It's so unbelievable to watch the eagle soar and plummet down into the water and grab a fish. I saw a video where an eagle actually caught this pike that looked, it was way longer than the eagle's wingspan. So big he couldn't even get out of the water. So instead he took his massive wings and he swam through the water. It's impressive to watch the eagle. But it's equally as impressive to watch the hummingbird, to shift directions, fly upside down, do all that he does, go to a flower that's so delicate that the human touch will destroy it, and gain sus substance from that as he feeds the way that God has designed him with his capability. The fact that he's so small but yet can do so many amazing things. You are created uniquely. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You created with spiritual gifts. You were created for a specific purpose. You are created to honor God and your calling and with those gifts. And you were created to work in harmony with others. You were marvelously made. Fly. Whether you're an eagle, whether you're a hummingbird, fly the way God marvelously created you to fly. So God created you. He created you in a marvelous and wonderful way. The wonder of flight is that you can fly with what He's given you. Finally, He's got a plan. He doesn't intend to create you so uniquely and not have you do something special with that gift. He has a plan for you. The Bible says we are all to walk worthy of our calling. Walking worthy of the giftings he's given us. Walking worthy means also saying, God, show me your ways. Let's turn to Jeremiah. 29 and verse 11. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and to give you a hope. I know the plans I have for you. I had a wise man who was at my workplace, who was Japanese, 
He lived in Japan, but came over to the U.S., and he was mentoring me. And we were doing a lot of different projects, and a lot of those projects required significant planning. And on one of the visits, when he came back to the United States to talk, to check on the status of those projects, he said, Jeff Song, he said, a plan without action is simply just a thought. Just a thought. Yeah. We want to move towards action. We want to move so that it's not just a thought, but that we're moved and motivated to action. Faith without works, the Bible says, is dead. It's called the step of faith. Paul describes that you are to run the race set before you. Last week we talked about mounting up on wings as eagles, running and not growing weary, walking and not fainting. The walk of faith is an action. The plan of God needs to be acted upon. He has plans for your provision. He has plans to prevent evil. He has plans for a future. He has pl plans for providing hope, vision, and direction. His plan is for you to fly. Figuratively, spiritually, for you to fly. For you to be faithful. When you face the storms of life, that you can extend your wings and soar like the eagle. When you need provision, you can flap your wings at 100 miles an hour like the hummingbird and get the food that you need. His plan is for you to thrive. So today, we should focus on God created you. You're no accident. You are intentional. He made you wonderful. He made you marvelous. And he has a plan. A plan that he wants you to take action on. So today, be a wonder. Take to the sky. Fly in the way God has shown you. Fly in the way God has created you. Fly knowing God is your designer. Defy the natural things that are holding you down and soar. Defy the law of gravity in your life through the power and the mind of the Holy Spirit empowered by God and Jesus in your heart. Overcome the gravity that holds you down. Use all of your gifts to accomplish your Hover if you're called to hover. Soar if you're called to soar. Rest when you're called to rest. Take the steps of faith to execute the plan. Don't let it just be a thought. Don't just let it be something that just sits on a shelf. Take action. Be a doer of the word. Walk worthy of your call. Your creator is with you. So today we talked about the wonder of flight. So I just challenge you today, be the wonder. Fly in the way God's called you to fly. Don't look, if you're an eagle, the way the hummingbird looks and said, I want to be a hummingbird. God created you to be an eagle. Don't look if you're a hummingbird at the eagle and say, man, I should be soaring. No, you should be hovering. You should be doing what you should call to do. Seek the Lord, and he shall be found. The Bible says, he knock, and he shall answer. Ask, and you shall receive. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Seek him diligently, because the sky awaits. God wants you to fly. He wants you to soar. He wants you to be experiencing that wonder of flight. So Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this simple message, Lord God, that celebrates you, that you created us wonderfully, marvelously, and that you had a plan for us to prosper for us to walk in your calling. So Father, I ask today that you would empower all of us, everyone who hears this message, Lord God, to walk in wonder, to 
walk in power, to walk in might, to walk worthy of the calling that you've given us. Lord, we celebrate our diversity. And Lord, we thank you that you will plug us all in exactly where we need to be plugged. Take away the blockades, the chains of the enemy, and allow us to thrive with God and to walk in that creative purpose where you called us. We give you praise this day as you accomplish it in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so glad that you can join us online. And now we invite you to join us in person in the beautiful Smoky Mountains in Sevierville, Tennessee, where we meet in the Douglas Lake Resort Clubhouse. We hope that you can come and find that it's good to be home. See you Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Have a great day.